Welcome back everybody to the Raid Mastery series, the place where I will be revisiting every raid in the game, providing a concise modern guide full of tips, tricks, easy skips and meta recommendations. We're now officially halfway done and to kick off the second half we have my personal favourite raid of all time, Deepstone Crypt. Entrance in order to open the door to the desolation section, all ads must be killed. Loading in with a rocket launcher like Galahorn is a good choice, but this isn't too important. What is important, however, is knowing where particular ads hide, since they tend to spread out a lot once players get close enough. The hiding spots can be seen on screen now. Desolation. The home of one of the most famous Sparrow techs known as 1-7, the Desolation section is a Sparrow traversal encounter with only one core mechanic, Frostbite. As you traverse the storm, you will slowly accumulate Frostbite stacks, and when they hit 10, you will die. In order to prevent yourself from dying, you must drive between the heat bubbles which act as checkpoints to cleanse your Frostbite stacks. The map of the encounter can be seen on screen with the regular route highlighted in green. Keep in mind that if you die, if you respawn, you will get reset to the beginning of the track, so instead of respawning, have one of your teammates revive you instead. If you know how to slip Slipstream, I don't think I need to tell you what to do here since I'm sure you're already very familiar with this encounter, but if you can't slipstream and happen to be on a hunter, you can perform the following Shatterscape which ends up skipping Bubble 2 entirely, speeding things up just a little. A couple things to note with Desolation is that there are certain checkpoints you need to hit in order to properly progress the raid, one located here, and the second can be hit either here or here. You know you've hit every CP properly if on approach to the crypt itself the certified banger Athanasia starts playing. Crypt Security Crypt Security is a rare type of encounter in which the main objective is to destroy a non-hostile game object that has its own boss-like health bar. Located in the centre of the arena are six giant fuses that need to be destroyed in order to complete the encounter, with each side of the arena, dubbed Light and Dark Side, having three fuses each. Fun fact, the health pool of each fuse is linked to a lone vandal located under the map. Loadouts wise, have every player responsible for destroying fuses use either Bastion, which can solo two burst the fuse if you have a damage buff, the Fourth Horseman, which can solo two burst the fuse provided you have the Catalyst and have a damage buff with Surges, or the Warcliffe Coil which can also solo one burst a single fuse with Surges and a Well. I would actually advise against using the popular Xenophage since the formerly presented options are simply just better. Interestingly enough, each fuse can be debuffed but only by Void Weaken, though since they get destroyed so easily by the aforementioned options it's typically not worth going out of your way to do this, not to mention the fact that you must weaken each fuse individually despite them all being connected to a single Vandal. Mechanically speaking, Crypt Security introduces two of the three main mechanic roles present throughout the entire raid, these being Operator and Scanner. And if you've played the mission Operation Seraph Shield, you may already be familiar with these. The role of the Operator is to activate glowing red panels scattered throughout the arena, which when activated, perform certain actions. The role of the Scanner is to read certain glowing yellow panels that directly give information to the Operator. The long and short of it is, begin the encounter by having someone collect the Operator Augment from the terminal and have them enter the basement. At the same time, one player on Dark Side should kill the Scanner Vandal and begin reading which Operator panels in the basement are the correct ones to shoot. There are always two panels per side, four in total. A map of the encounter is up on screen now with the numbered basement panels, including locations of where scanner players should stand on each side in order to see the correct panels. After dark side is done scanning, pass the augment via the terminal and read the panels for light side. Once the operator has activated each correct panel, damage will begin. Again, you can't just shoot any fuse, you must destroy them in a particular order that only the scanner player can see. But the scanning location for this is now in the basement, so have your operator send their augment back up via the terminal and allocate one person above to retrieve it, then have the light scanner send it down to the basement once again. The basement player should now see one of the six miniature fuses glowing yellow, which in this case is light left, which must be called out to the damaged players. After that specific fuse is destroyed, another will be picked until the phase is over or all six are destroyed. If you've set up your loadouts correctly, you should be in for a very easy one phase. Now onto the juicy stuff, starting with Op Sword In. Op Sword In is a trick used to get both the scanner and the operator in the basement so they can work together to identify each panel faster while 
while also preventing the need to pass scanner between terminals upstairs. To do this trick, have both players stand right outside the basement door and have another player standing at the upstairs terminal. Instruct the player at the terminal to pick up operator and as soon as you see the operator fade out of the basement terminal, swing your sword and you should be able to enter right before the door closes. Now send operator back down and once the scanner vandal is dead, send scanner down too. Finally, I thought I would at least mention oob scanning. While harder to pull off, oob or out of bounds scanning is the premier way to efficiently complete this encounter as it completely negates the need for any terminal swapping and while I won't be going over it today, I've collaborated with my good friend Mike in a video on his channel going over the whole process in considerable depth for those that want to know more, link in the description. Atrax Loadouts wise, all players should be running Parasite and their class's most optimal burst super, which for Titans is Kuras Thundercrash, for Hunters is Star Eater Blade Barrage, and for Warlocks is Vortex Nova. Atrax is a unique boss encounter and to this day is still the only one of its kind. Much like Crypt Security, Atrax is also very gimmicky and there are a few things that should be mentioned before we move on any further. Firstly, it is impossible to debuff Atrax with anything but Void Weaken. Tractor Cannon, Tether, Felwinter's Helm, and even Divinity have no actual effect. You will see yellow numbers, yes but in reality, your damage is unchanged. So if you can, have at least one person, preferably a Warlock, running weakened grenades for the team. Second, identically to Crypt Security, Atrax health bar is linked to a captain out of the map, which creates one main problem, health updating. Unfortunately, due to how she's coded, Atrax health does not update particularly fast, which puts a large emphasis on single burst damage options, which is why you'd never use something like Grand Overture on Atrax, since despite it being equal in strength to Parasite in terms of its burst damage capability, said damage comes out in several separate instances and Atrax does not like this. This issue also applies to the aftershocks from Thundercrash, however there is a partial solution which is to force her health to update. To force the updates, you must use a weapon that has a higher rate of fire and multiple damage instances per shot, which is why rapid fire shotguns work quite well for this purpose since they fire fast and each shot has around 8 pellets in it. With all that cleared up, the main idea of the fight is to once again collect the operator and scanner augments, however this time they serve different purposes. Begin the fight by sending 4 players up into the space station and have the remaining 2 players clear all waves of ads on the bottom floor including the sentinel servitors. Collect the operator augment from the vandal and activate 2 of the escape pod panels to send 2 of them down for the both of you. Once they've arrived, take the escape pods into to space and prepare for damage. While not necessary, if you're the operator, having a weapon with ricochet rounds can be quite beneficial as you will see shortly. The start of the damage phase is linked to the death of the third sentinel servitor in the space station, so ideally the space station team should have killed two of them and held back on killing the third until the two players from downstairs arrived. Also ensure that the space station team collected the scanner augment from the corresponding vandal. When all six players are up, kill the third sentinel and damage will commence. The scanner player should now be able to see which Atrax is the real one and instead of simply calling, for example, example, that one over there, please refer to these standard callouts. Pods, left, right, and window. When everyone is gathered around the correct Atrax, do a quick 3-2-1 and on one, everyone should pop their super and parasite shortly after. Damage should never be a problem here since Atrax has so little health, so you should one floor every time. After the clone is defeated, have your operator collect the replication that it drops and take it to one of the airlocks. Open the airlock by activating the panel and perform a self-cleanse by crouching and shooting the door at an angle with your ricochet rounds weapon in order to remove it from you. This might take a couple tries since sometimes it reattaches to you, but it's also entirely unnecessary necessary if your team is capable of one or two cloning final stand, but I thought it was worth mentioning anyway. You can also die on purpose with the replication in order to reset the timer, but this is truly desperate. Every other Atrax clone will now teleport up for final stand, so the scanner player should ideally be standing here, which again gives them a good view of all of the clones. In a perfect world, someone should have saved their times 20 parasite for final stand, since this lets you end the encounter in one clone. Spacewalk. Step 1. Deafen in Discord. Step 2. Turn your music volume all the way up. Alright, alright, we've all heard this one before. The joke's getting pretty old now, I know. Enjoy this section at your own leisure and also be sure to grab the quote-unquote secret chest on your way. Descent. Loadouts wise, Trinity Ghoul is an S tier option, but you can also use Witherhold or Anarchy to effectively spawn trap add doors. Note that if you're using Anarchy, the grenades need to be placed in a specific spot in order to make sure the adds don't phase through them with their iframes, which for far left, mid mid and far right is slightly away from the door, and for mid left and mid right, this is top of the stairs. Warlocks should be running Sunbracers, Titans running Solar or Strand, and Hunters on Arc. The main goal of this encounter is to deposit nuclear cores in the four bins located in the center of the arena for a total of six rounds with 
with two cores per round. Similar to the Desolation encounter, holding a nuclear core makes you accumulate stacks of radiation that kill you at 10 stacks, plus reducing you to walking speed. Again, Operator and Scanner will be dropping from their corresponding Vandals, but this time the third and final augment makes its debut appearance also dropping from its own Vandal, the Suppressor. In this fight, Operators are tasked with hitting the panel responsible for spawning the nuclear cores, which is done when you hear a distinct alarm sound. Scanners are responsible for calling out which of the four bins are the correct ones to dunk, again indicated by a glowing yellow texture. Suppressors have the most important job, which is to stun Tanex in order to unlock the bins performed by shooting Tanex while standing under the suppressor drones located left, middle and right. After each round is complete, one of the augment players will randomly have their augment deactivated, which means they won't be able to use it and must deposit it in the terminal for another player to pick up and take over their previous job. Deactivated players will then receive a 45 second augment lockout timer, preventing them from reacquiring the augment. With the main mechanics out of the way, let's talk efficiency. First, standard callouts for the bins should be derivations of top and bottom. Many people like to use numbers or front and back, but for simplicity's sake, top and bottom are the most friendly since everyone can associate Tanex being at the top of the arena and the rally flag being at the bottom, at least if you're looking from a bird's eye view. Second, high mobility makes a big difference in this and the next encounter since you can't sprint when carrying a core, so if you can, try to get at least tier 6 or 7 mobility. Third, since the start of each round is sped up by the death of all of the adds and there just so happen to be five ad spawn doors, you should assign one player to each door and constantly spawn trap each emerging ad. The sixth player should ideally be the suppressor since they need to be free to roam around, which leads very nicely onto my next point, preserving augments. Out of all of the jobs, suppressor is the most demanding, I suppose you could say, so if your group has a confident suppressor, you'd ideally want to keep them on the job the whole time and avoid being deactivated, and you can actually do this. If you're the suppressor, after every successful suppress, eight seconds later, you're augment has the chance of being deactivated. So immediately after you suppress, deposit it in the terminal and wait for one of the other two augments to be deactivated instead, then pick suppressor back up. The final tech is a trick that can be used by the operator which involves manipulating the spawns of the nuclear cores so that the far left spawn is never triggered. In order to do this, there are two cases you must be prepared for. If the far left panel is glowing, shoot it. If the far left panel isn't glowing, shoot the far right panel. The main reason you'd want to do this is that the far left spawn is the furthest away from any of the bins, meaning any players that pick up from far left will come out of it with higher than normal radiation stacks, which could lead to unnecessary deaths. Once the sixth round is over, head down into the escape pod and chill out. If you want to avoid limping slash going granny, waste your super and once you hear the escape pod crash, count to seven and on six or seven start sword swinging by mashing your super key in order to maintain your full movement capabilities after the pod crashes. Tanix. Rocket launchers are the play for Tanix, so make sure you have a Galahorn plus some method of debuffing like Tractor Cannon or Tether. Class-wise, you only need one Warlock running a Lunar Faction Well of Radiance, and the rest should be purely burst supers like Needlestorm, Thundercrash, and Blade Barrage. Much like Descent, the nuclear core mechanic is back once again, but this time there are six bins, two per side. Begin the fight by waking up Tanix and clearing all waves of adds until the Augment Vandals spawn. Scanner and Suppressor have the exact same job as before, but Operator is slightly different as you'll see shortly. After every single ad is dead, Tanix will move for the first time between Orange and Spawn, and then any other time he moves, it can be between any of the three sides. Once he's in place, the four boosters on his torso will become damageable, and at the same time he will begin summoning orbital strikes that will kill you in one hit regardless of your level or damage resistance, so be sure to avoid these. If you instantly break any booster, this will cause Tanix to stagger and he won't summon any orbital strikes. After each booster is broken, everyone except the operator and the suppressor should now pick up a nuclear core and deliver them to the four bins not on the side that Tanix is on. The suppressor should now once again run between the drones, shooting Tanix while under each one. Shortly after the core running phase begins, depending on the speed of the suppress, one or two players will be encased in a detain that can only be broken by the operator. After all four cores have been deposited, damage will begin roughly 15 seconds later. Before we talk about damage, let's talk about optimization. Ideally, the suppressor player should be the one responsible for debuffing and the operator player should be the one on Galahorn. Furthermore, there's a bit of a skill gap when it comes to suppressing since if you're fast enough, you can perform what's known as a one detain, which means you stun Tanix fast enough, causing him to detain only one player, not two. The easiest way to one detain is to assign a warlock to it and follow the actions in the clip playing now. Okay, go to three. 
Okay, whoever's- Finally, after you've dunked all four cores, you can actually force Tanix to TP to mid instead of waiting by simply killing all of the adds on the map. After the final ad dies, not only will Tanix instantly teleport to the middle, damage will immediately begin and he won't do his push attack. Back to damage, the only thing worth noting is that the timing of your burst supers matter. You see, when Tanix health passes the final stand threshold, he will teleport away from the middle to any random side, but if you time your burst supers correctly, you can bypass this entirely by killing him right on the spot shortly after this trigger is hit. The proper timing for this is to activate your super once the health bar passes the left side of the T in Tanix. And that about does it. Thanks for watching and I hope you learned something. What? I'm, I'm actually clipping that.